in September when he signed legislation for the 540,000 fast food workers who work across California, increasing their minimum wage from $16 an hour to $20 an hour. It went into effect this week. Here to talk about that and more is our panel this week. Michael Tubbs is the former mayor of Stockton. He's a special advisor to California Governor Gavin Newsom for economic mobility. You can read his remarkable life story in his memoir, The Deeper the Roots, which has been endorsed by Oprah and Alice Walker, among others. Andrew Gruel is a chef, TV host, and restaurant owner. He is the co-owner of the Calico Seafood Chop House in Huntington Beach. And these photos of his food are making all of us hungry. Well done with that. <laughs> Very nice. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, chef, since you're the uh, chef, let's start with you. And we're talking about the restaurant industry. This fast food, $20 an hour minimum wage. No other state in the country has it. I know you pay your workers over minimum wage. You believe in that. Mm -hmm. But you don't believe in this as a government regulation. Correct. And I know that there might be some inherent conflict in that statement, right? Uh, yeah, I've read the bill and gone into detail. So I'll say a couple things about it. I think that the bill's intention is actually really good. I think that we should be treating our workers a lot better. I think people should be paying them more. I've said this. I've railed against the corporations. I just don't necessarily agree with the means by which they get there. I think that a lot of the language in this bill is incredibly redundant. My philosophy behind this bill is, is that it's actually going to hurt the worker because they're going to get laid off. A lot of things are going to get automated. The big corporations saw this coming, and they're already starting to do that. We've seen it with Pizza Hut. We've heard all the news over the past couple days. And then those workers are going to be out of job, which is going to cost the state more money and unemployment benefits. So in closing, what I would say is, is that my perspective on this is, is that while I agree with the idea, I think that we need to change the incentive structure, right? So if we change it such that we cut payroll taxes for the businesses that are paying their employees really well, and there's the right incentive structure there, then we don't need these new layers of bureaucracy and government officials that are ultimately going to be dropping a hammer on these businesses and we can support those businesses that treat and pay their workers well and if they don't well guess what they're going to be paying the current level of payroll tax if not higher if they don't treat them well. Mayor Tubbs your thoughts? No, I, I, first of all I appreciate um, the, the thinking around in, a different incentive structure and I think part of what precipitated this bill was the fact that of the Un, un, unsheltered workers, the biggest sector they work in are fast food workers. These are a half a million people who are making less than $40,000 a year in an incredibly expensive state. At the same time, the corporations are making billions of dollars. So I don't think any law is perfect, but I do think sort of raising the floor, as you've done with your businesses, is, is, is good, right? And I think we also have to be thoughtful about it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to solve everything. We should look at sort of ways to reward good employers. We should look at ways to make it easier for small businesses to operate. But I think for the state of California, it's a good thing. And as we've seen, since we've raised the minimum wage the last several years, that I think over 100,000 fast food jobs have been created since the minimum wage rose in 2015, 16, 17, 18, and now. But when you see the prices are already going up in a lot of fast food, doesn't that really hurt, especially low-income people who eat fast food disproportionately? And, uh, but I think what, what, what's frustrating about the conversation around this bill in particular is that we're blaming this particular bill for a lot of other outside market forces. We know that, I think I saw something this morning that In-N-Out raised the price of a double-double, 30 cents, despite the fact they were already paying their workers above the current minimum wage, et cetera. So I think prices are, are raising, but that's a, more of a symptom of corporate greed, of price gouging, and less of a response to this particular legislation. And in fact, people having more money makes them better able to pay for these increased prices. But I'm not sure it's safe to say that these prices are increased because the minimum wage was increased. Your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, and I actually agree with that to some degree. I do think that the economy is already increasing prices by virtue of a national inflation and what's happening with our currency. I think specifically in the markets in which this is really going to disproportionately hurt small businesses and medium-sized businesses, whether it's an individual franchisee owner or a small business, because I know that this applies only to the fast food restaurants with 60 plus more locations, et cetera. This is now going to hurt the smaller businesses because if I lose all my employees and they go to work for somebody else and I can't afford to automate or I can't afford to pay $20 an hour, um, which, you know, not because of corporate greed when it's just like a mom and pop run shop, they're going to have to increase their wages in order to compete, which means they're going to increase their prices. And I'll also throw in there too, if we put the $20 minimum, you know, wage piece of this bill aside, I think we could actually get into a lot more of the, the meat that we can kind of dissect and take apart. Because frankly, I think we're beyond $20 
already. And 20 isn't even living wage in most places. San Francisco, it's $35 an hour. But then on the, on the flip side, in Bakersfield, California, living wage is sixteen sixty six an hour, right? So how do you apply this bill on a regional basis when it's just kind of a blanket number across a state that's as big as, you know, most countries? Right. It's just such, so huge. And all of these things that we're dealing with in California right now go down to our biggest issue, which is affordability. It is so hard to live here because there, it's just out of reach, especially housing for a lot of people. This is something you work on as much as anybody. The last time you were with us, you talked about this idea of piloting universal basic income across the state. Mm. Where are we at on that? Any sort of top line update on that? Yeah, I think the top line update is that we have over 150 mayors across the country who are doing this work. And the biggest, the state with the highest numbers in California, about 30, 35 mayors, 10 counties. L.A. County has the largest program in the country. And what we're seeing is that, much like the debate we're having about minimum wage, is that when people are given money, they are able to spend it in the local economy. They're able to take care of their family. They're able to pay for rent. And they're able to work. In fact, consistently, not just in California, but across the country, everywhere this has been piloted, we see the same thing. Employment goes up. Part-time to full-time work goes up. People are healthier and able to do the things we want them to do, like take care of their kids, participate in community, and work. Do you think it's an interesting idea? Actually, I do. I'm very familiar with Michael's work in regards to UBI and, and his end poverty initiatives. And I actually agree fundamentally with all of it. Um, where I would disagree is the way in which we get there. I think that when we're taking taxpayer dollars to give them to people, I think that the government's going to siphon off a portion of that. I want to see $1 of $1 go to the people as an investment in order to help them give them kind of this stepping stone. I agree with that 100%. I think there's ways in which you can do it where you bring in private corp corporations, nonprofits, and you actually give, once again, change the incentive structure, give them tax incentives or cuts so that all of that money goes directly to the organization and they disseminate $1 on $1. I just don't trust the government to not keep some for themselves. Your thoughts on that? Wait, that's a win. Like, I, I, think that's, that's a, that's, I think the fact that we can agree that, yes, we should trust people with money and invest in people, that's a huge shift from where we right. were just, just five years ago. And like I said, I'm also... Innovation applies in, in, in all things, so I'm definitely open to ways to do so in which that the more money goes directly to folks. Like I, actually, I don't think bureaucracy, just for bureaucracy's sake, is a good thing. I, I, yeah. So we definitely have agreement there. Look at this. We're making deals happen here on The Issue Is. Uh, another <laughs> story that got a lot of national attention this week is this bill put forward by Matt Haney, the assembly member from San Francisco, which would essentially say that your boss can't contact you after hours. Uh, with the exception being an emergency or if there was a situation uh, with a scheduling change and they could potentially be fined $100 encouraging people to disconnect from work. Uh, is this a good idea or just too much bureaucracy? Well, you know, I talk about the bureaucracy again, and I think it's just layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy that continue to give un either unelected officials or appointed officials more power over the individual. So I don't fundamentally agree with it. However, I will flip this and say this. I'm totally fine with, with the basis of this bill, but I think it needs to work both ways. I think also employees <laughs> can't communicate with me after hours and contact me because I'll tell you right now, it's lopsided. 200 text messages from the team members. I'm not bothering them after hours. I assure you that. Okay. Uh <laughs> Uh, is this a good idea or is this a little a little unnecessary? Oh, well, first, let me, in full disclosure, Susan Member Haney is one of my dearest friends, okay. so a big supporter. And I think his study of other countries and how they seem to have more work-life balance is what kind of motivated this bill. But I think to your point, the good employers already do this. And for my understanding of the bill, it just says you have to have a policy. Like you and your employers have to have something written that talks about sort of what's the protocol for communicating after hours. And with that explanation, this makes a lot of sense. I'm surprised everyone doesn't already do that. Um, so Governor Newsom has not given the official state of the state yet. It's been delayed two different times. We still aren't clear exactly when it's coming. Uh, but as somebody who uh, looks at the state very closely, both of you, I was wondering if you had to describe the state of the state in a sentence, what is the state of the state of California right now? Progressing, but still with challenges. Your thoughts? I would say too top heavy, way too expensive, and, the, and that's by virtue of the tax system. Okay. <laughs> so we found some areas of agreement, some areas of disagreement, but we do want to uh, end with something uh, called personal issues. This is where we do the cultural favorites. Both of you, I think, have done this at different points, but I want to see if we can find areas where you may or may not agree. So we're going to do our personal issues game, and we'll ask each of you the same question. First thing that comes to mind. What is your favorite TV show right now? So good. Oh my God. 
gosh, uh, probably Bluey. Bluey. I almost said, almost said yeah. Bear, though. I almost yeah. said Bear because you're here, but I haven't watched uh, it. Favorite musical artist? Um, my gosh, I would say either uh, musical artist, all out musician, um, uh, Herbie Hancock or Keith Jarrett. All right. So I'm yeah. going to say Keith Sweat. Um, J. Yeah. Cole. J. Cole. We know that. Favorite sports team? Lakers. Yankees. And what is the best part about being a dad? Everything. Like, it's just, I, what's not the best part? Everything. I say everything. Yeah, and you've got three kids, three right? Them. Three kids three right now, and you've got... Four kids. Four kids, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no kids. I don't, so I'm way behind you guys. Uh, what's the best part about being a dad? Well, I can be a kid again. And they laugh at my jokes. <laughs> I mean, it genuinely gives me license to be a complete child. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And does your wife give you that license too? No, she actually revoked my license, um, uh, <laughs> even with the DMV. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, great to have both of you here. Thanks for the work that you do in our community. We appreciate it. Um, we got to check out your restaurant. We've got to do this over food next time. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. it's so much yeah. easier. That <laughs> oh, yeah. Way, right? oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. But we end with music always on this show, and I know how much you love J. Cole. Appreciate so it. we go to break with some J. Cole. More of the issue is after this. One time for my L.A. sisters. One time for my L.A., L.A. Lame, you can't tell the difference.